Bismillah. Very good. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa la'ali wa sahbihi wa man wala. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la. Ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'd. We start in the name of Allah, the Most High. The one to whom belongs all praise. The one who controls all affairs. The one who sustains us and everything else in creation. And to, the one to whom we return. Glorified and exalted is He. We send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his family and his followers until the end of time. Ameen. Uh, as I mentioned in the post, I've, how many of you were here after four? Everyone was here? So we don't have to review. So we talked about, uh, we're going to spend some time on that ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And so we have to tackle each one individually. And to do so, uh, we start with La ilaha illallah. And when we think about La ilaha illallah and we, we, we talk about La ilaha illallah, we, we begin with a negation. We begin with a negation and we end with an affirmation. So we say there is no God. There is no God except one God. And this concept of, of beginning with a negation and then proceeding to an affirmation is something we also see in other areas of, uh, of Islamic studies or Islamic thought, particularly in the field of tezkiyah. In the field of tezkiyah, in the field of purification of the soul, which is one of the main um, roles of the Prophet wasallam, which we'll get to later on. But one of the roles of the Prophet wasallam, as Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, and I believe four different places, similar wordings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ That He is the one, Allah is the one, who has sent amongst the people, the unlettered people, you know, He sent amongst these people, a messenger from among them. This messenger will recite to them His verses, Allah's verses. He will purify them. And he will teach them the book and the wisdom. So he has these different capacities. The second of those capacities is that he will purify them. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will teach them how it is that the person goes from a level of, of, of being at a place where, for example, the nafs is amaratun bisu. That the person has a, a nafs or an, a, an, an ego that is commanding them to that which is bad. And then how do they get to the point where they have a nafs al lawama That they have the nafs that is blaming itself. It's looking at, it's kind of wobbling in between. Sometimes it's doing good, sometimes it's leaning to something bad, and it's stopping itself from doing that bad thing. Now this is a progression on the path of the spiritual state. And then the Prophet ﷺ teaches them also then how do you get to a nafs al-mutma'inna. The nafs that is completely at peace with what Allah has brought. Which is the end goal of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says when he says, لا يؤمن أحركم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جدتوبي that no one believes until their, their desires fall in line with what I have brought. That the person is trying to get their desires to fall in line with what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has brought. And in that there is submission to the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but there is also more importantly submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Truly and actually. And so when we look at tazkiyah, oftentimes they say in tazkiyah that you have a takhliya qabla tahliya. That in tazkiyah what you're doing is you get rid of the bad things because then you can put the good things in. So they say for example that sometimes people want, they go to different things and they want to attain different benefits or whatever it might be. But if someone doesn't come with humility one of the things we learned from the hadith of Jibreel salam, when Jibreel comes in, he sits in front of the Prophet them to ask him about Islam and to ask him about Iman and to ask him about Ihsan. He sits in front of the Prophet them in a very humble sitting. He puts his hands on his legs, he asks him these questions. If the person doesn't come with humility to learn or to gain benefit, then they say, you can't put anything in a cup that's already full. If the cup is already full, how are you going to put anything into it? So if the cup, if the heart is already full 
of bad desires, of leanings towards different things, if the heart is already filled with love of other than Allah, how is it supposed to have space for the love of Allah? If it's filled with worship and obedience to everything other than Allah, then how is it supposed to be filled with love and obedience to Allah? So the heart then has to be, there has to be a negation before there's an affirmation. And when we come to the shahada, when we come to la ilaha illallah, we come to a negation before there's an affirmation. La ilaha illallah, we're starting by saying, there is nothing that we worship other than Allah. To say that there is nothing that we worship other than Allah is, a, is, is the first half of the shahada is a vertical experience. Not to describe Allah with direction per se, but to say that it's a vertical experience and that it's a connection with the divine. When you say La ilaha illallah, it's a connection with the divine, it's vertical. When you say Muhammad Rasulullah, it's a connection with the creation, it's horizontal. So we start then with La ilaha illallah, that there is no God but Allah. What does this mean? This means that we have no desire, we have no goal, we have nothing that we worship, we have nothing that we depend upon, we have nothing that we seek other than Allah. That's a very difficult place to get to, is it not? It's a very difficult place to get to. We can say it intellectually, but to get to it spiritually is a whole different issue. And so that, that tension that occurs when we have something in our mind that we know, we know that la ilaha illallah, what does this mean? This means that there is only one source for everything in creation. Everything in creation has one source, and khaliq That one source is the only dependency that we have. It's the only thing that we seek. This also means that everything that exists in creation, there shouldn't be artificial distinguishment between them. So for example, sometimes in our communities we struggle with artificial barriers. We have artificial barriers of language, we have artificial barriers of culture, we have artificial barriers of color, we have artificial barriers of, of race, we have artificial barriers of economic status, all of these are artificial barriers. Because all of these are nothing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is not permissible for the one who is affirming that Allah is one. It is not permissible for the one who is affirming that Allah is one to put up these artificial barriers. To look down upon someone else for any of these reasons or to create any sort of... And we see this all the time in our communities. Uh, if a community is more homogenous, you don't, you don't hear it as much, but it still exists. But if there's diversity, you see it every single day. I mean, when I was in, 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 in a masjid that shall not be named, that happens to be more diverse, you would see it very often. You know, South Asians look down upon the Arabs because the Arabs aren't seri enough, serious enough in their commitment to Islam. And the Arabs look down on the South Asians because the South Asians are not sophisticated enough in their understanding of Islam. <laughs> right? Or these different things. Everyone has their different whatever it might be. You know, they think this is this and they think that is that. And all of a sudden you have all of these artificial barriers. La ilaha illallah means you cannot have these artificial barriers. That all of the prophets are brothers and anyone who says the shahada is my brother in faith and my sister in faith. And that faith trumps everything else. Because we go then to the top. The top is la ilaha illallah, that Allah exists. When we think about Allah then as we affirm the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we affirm the existence of some an entity that has infinite names. And so we start then our journey of understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by understanding His names. And the best place perhaps to begin that journey is to begin it in Al-Fatiha. That you begin Al-Fatiha and you start immediately. Allah is Allah. Alhamdulillah. Allah. He is Ar-Rabb. He is Ar-Rahman. He is Ar-Rahim. He is Al-Malik. He is the one that we seek. He is the one that we worship. He is the one who guides. Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim. He is the one who is Al-Hadi. All of these names are already there in the beginning of Al-Fatiha to lay down the path for us in understanding Allah. Everything that we do should have Allah in mind. Should have Allah in mind. Everything. It's not just prayer because of prayer. It's not just prayer because of habit. It's not just things that we do. This is not, Islam is not habit. Islam is choice. 
is a choice to turn ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every time that we affirm that He is the Lord. And we have to renew that choice. We have to constantly remember that choice. And this is part of the reason why we have to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah so many times in every single day because it needs to be renewed. So we look at the names of Allah and we start to think about the names of Allah as a way to engage with Him and to understand Him. But to keep Him at the center of everything. I'll tell you a story about, uh, it's a fake story. 99.9% .9 it's fake. I don't see that it's, it, it doesn't really seem that it's possible that it's true. But it has a good meaning. So, uh, and it helps to keep us focused on the principle. And the principle is Allah. If Allah is present in our interactions, everything is going to be okay. But if we live our lives, even if we're living the outward lives of Muslims, but we live our lives without Allah present in our minds, then we missed a lot. It becomes materialistic. So the story is the story of a, a woman who was very poor. She lived in a town and she was a seamstress. You know, she would sew and different things. But she was very, very poor. And there was a man who was passing through this town who himself was even more poor. And he was passing through and he was a traveler and he had nothing. And nobody was taking care of him. So she saw this man and she felt very bad for him. She wanted to you know, give him some food or whatever she could from the very little bit that she had. Just very little in the first place. She wanted to do something good for this person for the sake of Allah. So she gave him some food. She did whatever she could you know, in terms of hospitality. And then this person went. When he left, he told her, May the first thing that you do tomorrow last all day. May the first thing that you do tomorrow last all day. So this woman thought to herself, it's a very strange thing. <laughs> you know, you're traveling through the place, you need help, I give you some help. The response that you give in the end is, may the first thing that you do tomorrow last all day. So she's like, okay, fine. Next day comes. Next day comes, she gets a job. The job, someone brings her a job to sew something, and they want her to sew a piece of golden thread on a cloth. Just embroider this small piece of golden thread on the cloth. So she takes the job. And the custom of the people of that time is that whatever thread is left over after the job, it stays with the seamstress. It stays with the seamstress. So she does her little job, she sews it on. And then she goes to roll up. She realizes the thread that's left over, she realizes that it's all there still. You know, she sewed it on and the amount that's sitting there to be used is the same amount as when she started. So she goes to roll it up and it just keeps going. And she remembers what the guy said. May the first thing that you do tomorrow last all day. So she's rolling up this ball of golden yarn and it just rolls up and rolls up and rolls up and rolls up until it becomes a huge ball. So she's very rich now. You know, she can fix her home, she can establish her business, everything. Her whole situation has changed. So all the neighbors now are wondering, what is it that you did? How did this happen? Now all of a sudden you have all this stuff and so she tells them the story. This man came and this is what he would look like and this is what happened and then I got this huge golden ball of yarn and I was able to become very wealthy. So they're like, wow, this is amazing. Some time passes and the same man passes through the town. And another man who's in the town who heard the story of this woman, he says, man, this is my chance. This guy's passing through. Let me reach out to him and do some good to him. Take care of him, let him stay with me, give him some food, give him, I'm going to do all the ikram to him. So he goes and he gets the man and he does all the ikram to him, right? And then afterwards when he goes to leave, he, he tells the man, you know, before you go, if you could just make dua for me. The guy said, I don't really do that, but I'll say this. Whatever you do first thing tomorrow morning, may it last all week. So he even upped it, right? So the guy's excited. He's like, she got, may it last all day. I got, may it last all week. It's coming from the same guy. So he makes the intention. What is his intention? First, his intention is bad from the beginning, right? But his intention now is when I wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going to go and I'm going to head straight to my office. When I get to my office, I'm going to start counting my money. And I'm going to count my money and then it's going to last all week. So I'm going to be counting lots of money, right? So he wakes up in the morning and he goes out and then he's walking to his office where he's going to count his money and he passes by the well. He thinks to himself, you know what, let me get something to drink. 
So he pulls out a bucket of water to drink, takes a drink. And then he has this urge to pull out another bucket of water. And another bucket of water. And another bucket of water. He realizes the buckets of water, they're going to last all week. So pulling out that many buckets of water, he floods his home. He floods the neighborhood. He almost floods the entire town. Okay. What is the difference between these two people? Didn't these two people do the same thing? Outwardly, they did the same thing, right? The woman saw this man who was in need. And she did a good deed towards him. The man saw this man who was in need and he did a good deed towards him. What is the difference? One of them was for Allah and one of them was for himself. One of them was for Allah and one of them is for himself. La ilaha illallah is to make sure as much as we can and it is a continuous struggle that what we do, we do it for Allah. What we do, we do it for Allah. And that's going to mean we have to then, what does that look like? That looks like Muhammadun Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ then is the embodiment for us. How is it that the person who is seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lives a life horizontally with the people, with the creation, with the political structure that he lived in, with the social circumstances that he lived in, with the cultural issues that he faced, with the poverty, with the oppression. How is it that a person who is trying to live la ilaha illallah vertically, how is it that that comes out horizontally? And that's why Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not just a connection with Allah that stays in the person's heart or a connection with Allah that stays in the person's home. But it is the manifestation of what does that faith mean in people's lives. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that. He taught us that from before the revelation even became, came to him. And he taught us that all the way up to the day that he died. In the, min in the minor level and in the major level. When the revelation begins to the Prophet ﷺ and he thinks that he's crazy, what does his wife tell him? She tells him, you're not crazy. Allah will not forsake you. And she tells him a number of things that are not acts of worship, ritual acts of worship. She tells him that you take care of the needy and you give victory to the oppressed and you maintain relations with your family and you feed those who are hungry. She starts telling him all of these social values. All of these values that are, are evidences that he is a trustworthy and good person. The Prophet ﷺ is described by all of these things. And then you go through his life and you see someone who was driven out by his people, who was oppressed, who was uh, taken advantage of, who was, uh, you know, everything was done to him. Eventually he gets into a position of power. How does someone act in the position of power? Is a very serious test of their faith. When they're in a position of authority, when they're in a position of strength, when they're in a position where they have the ability to take advantage of other people or to exact retribution for harms that were done to them, the Prophet ﷺ rides into Mecca with his head down and with tears coming out of his eyes. This is the way that he conquered Mecca ﷺ. He gives the example, what does it mean to live faith on the ground? What does it mean to live faith on the ground, on a major level, on the minor level? When he dies, what is one of the last things that the Prophet ﷺ does? Towards the end of his life, one of the last things that he does, among the last things that he does, he whispers in the ear of his daughter. And she starts to cry. Fatima radiallahu anha. She starts to cry. And then some time passes and he whispers in her ear again and she starts to smile. After the death of the Prophet them, they asked her what was said to her. But think about it, this is the end of his life. He's taking this moment, a very intimate moment with his daughter. He's showing what does this faith look like and how I deal with other human beings. He, she said, he whispered to me the first time, he said that I, am going, that I am going to meet my Lord. The time for me to meet my Lord is near. So I cried. And then he came to me and he whispered to me the second time and he told me that I will be among the first, I will be the first from his family to meet him there. And I smiled. So the Prophet ﷺ in those last moments took this time to be very intimate with his daughter. To have this nice conversation with his daughter. 
The Prophet ﷺ in the last khutbah talked about racism, talked about economic injustices, talked about political structures. He said if this person is put, if, if, if someone is put in charge of you, then you should follow them even if it is an Abyssinian slave. These are political issues. He dealt with this. This is in the last thing that he's saying to his people. So when we think about La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the takeaway is this, is that that encompasses everything in our faith. Everything in our faith that has to do with how we believe. How we believe, what we think about Allah, what we think about creation, what we think about resurrection, what we think about how we should live our lives. Everything on the side of belief and everything on the side of actualizing belief, which is the process of purification of the soul, all of that falls under la ilaha illallah. And everything that we think and believe and all the example of how we should exist and live amongst creation and amongst human beings, all of that is in Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whereas sometimes we glean over these things, we glean over these things, but the shahada is actually, it's there in the beginning as the first pillar of our faith for a reason. Because it is the pillar of our faith. It encompasses all of our belief vertically. It encompasses all of our belief horizontally. Everything is there. And so the thing that one of the things we should do then is what? Number one, to be connected to the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is the ultimate expression for us of what, it, what does Allah want from us. It's there in the Qur'an. If we want to worship Allah, if we want to submit to Allah, if we want to understand what that means, it's all there in the Qur'an. And if we want to see how to live that in real life, we look at the seerah, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. How did he live? That's one part of it. The other part of it is what I mentioned after the four rak'at, that when we make this dhikr, we should think about more than just the words. When we say, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, and we train our hearts on that, we train our hearts on focusing on Allah. And when we say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad, we focus our hearts on the example of how to live with the people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us and to forgive us and to help us to believe and actualize La ilaha illallah in everything that we do. And we ask Him to help us to follow the example and the path and the beautiful way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also in everything that we do. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallahu fikum. Don't forget us in your du'as and all of the people who are struggling with different tests all over the world, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.